guys, I'm back today to wrap up the things that I read in September. Um, I think I read in total 11 books, including a couple on audio, which I think anywhere between 8 and 11 is sort of my sweet spot at the moment, although I'm starting um, back at university next week, um, obviously all online, but that alongside my tutoring and the um, my part-time job as a nanny, that takes up more of my time, but I do do a fair bit of driving for work, so then I get through audiobooks. But yeah, I think overall I had pretty good, pretty good reading months, some real standouts, some bookstagram hyped books that were a bit of a dud for me. But um, I'll get started with what I've got in person and then I will put up pictures of the ones I didn't get um, to read in person or that I've lent to friends. So the first book I read was at Speculation by Jenny Offal. This was on my um, possibility pile video that I made. And um, I really liked it. I think the thing is with Offal, when I was getting ready to film this video, was that I was like really casting my mind back to really what this book was about. And I know I did read it now a month ago, but I think the thing is with her writing, ow, is that it doesn't really stick in my mind after I read it. I love the experience of reading it. I love the way she plays with prose and the, the very sparse language that she uses inside the head of one protagonist, but it doesn't stick with me for a long time afterwards. So this basically charts the progress of a couple um, going through their uh, like early marriage into the, like the, their mid. It was a pretty interesting introspection into married life and long term monogamy and what that means for a couple. That I um, really enjoyed being really be able to put my finger on what it was I really enjoyed about it. So I do like her writing. I guess I just don't find it the most memorable. I've actually stopped rating my books because I feel like. The one to five star system doesn't really um, take into account lots of the different nuances that make a book good or not. And I think I've been more frustrated in the rating systems I've seen online and the way that people denote good literature just by their enjoyment out of it. And I find that quite um, reductive. So I've decided I just stop rating my books and I'll just tell you what I think and whether I think they're worth reading. So I do recommend that one. I enjoyed Weather by her as well in the summer. Um, the next one I read was Exit Management by Naomi Booth. This was sent to me by Dead Ink Press and it was such a surprise. I really didn't think I was gonna love this as much as I did and it really it really took took me. It's a story of two um, people in their 20s and they are both living and working in London. They both come from different family setups that are um, quite unusual and have a lot of, I guess, uh, skeletons in their closet and it revolves around this one house where this elderly man who's um, falling ill lives and he strikes up a friendship with the main character Callum and then as the story progresses they become a lot closer and it transpires that the house might end up being his and it talks a lot about um, Brexit, about uh, gentrification in London, the rising house prices, there's a really sharp take on the current political landscape that we're living through but we also see the background story of the elder protagonist, Joseph, and his experience as a Hungarian World War II refugee and his life in Eastern Europe. So there's a really interesting dichotomy there between the present and the past and also the similarities we can draw between the experiences people had then and the, pe the experiences that people are having now. It looks at um, love, it looks at uh, like dysfunctional family relationships and secrets and yeah, it was I don't know why I was so surprised that I would like it because I realised afterwards that I had read The Art of Sinking by Naomi Booth, which is a really short novella about a phenomenon of girls who um, use their breath to make themselves feel like faint and then it's like they, they like start fainting a lot. And it's very bizarre, but it talks about body image and dysmorphia and mother-daughter relationships. She read that a couple of years ago and, and did enjoy that as well. So I finished with James Baldwin's Giovanni's Room. I wrapped this up in my last video, actually, where I spoke about my now last next, so I won't go into detail here, but I really adored James Baldwin's writing. It won't be the last I read of his, and I thought this was a really good entry point because it's so slim that it got me back into reading in a slower narrative style. So I'm looking to pick up more of his I think I will get a piece of his non-fiction probably next if I see it secondhand notes to a native son. Another non-fiction text that I read and adored was Hunger by Roxane Gay. I knew I was going to love this but I didn't realise quite how much I was going to love this. I get myself into a rut of reading non-fiction only on audio and then forget that um, I do really love to read it in its physical form as well. 
So Gay charts her history with her body and the experience of growing into a larger body because of the result of being raped as a adolescent and what that means and the process at which she gained a large amount of weight in order to physically protect her body from the male gaze and feel like she could build a wall up against the future attack of sexual violence. She talks about what it means to occupy a body that operates on the fringe of society that is viewed by so many people as so disgusting. And she really unpicks what it means to operate in that place when it, when it comes to dressing, when it comes to eating, when it comes to the medical um, prejudice she experiences. And I think it's a really fantastic insight into the body positivity movement and what it means to where, where the limits are to people's activism when it comes to being inclusive. Are we, are we only being inclusive of people up to the certain size? Are we only saying that your body positive or your body beautiful if you are still healthy? There's so many different nuances that come into that discussion that just aren't looked at when we talk about um, body image online. And I think there's so much more work to be done there. I'll just read a passage that was um, one of the 50 that I probably earmarked. This is um, chapter 41. I hate myself or society tells me I am supposed to hate myself. So I guess this at least is something I'm doing right. Or should I say I hate my body? I hate the weakness at being unable to control my body and I hate how I feel in my body. I hate how people see my body, how they stare at my body, treat my body, comment on my body. I hate equating my self-worth with my state of my body and how difficult it is to overcome this equation. This equation. I hate how hard it is to accept human frailty and I hate that I'm letting down so many women when I cannot embrace my body at any size. So I think Gay goes such a long way into showing her own vulnerability and her own, I guess, fallibility when it comes to being a, a representation of a larger body in, in the spotlight and what that means for her and what struggles that's created in her own, um, in her own brain and her own self-concept. So yeah, highly, highly recommend. Obviously, extremely triggering. Talks a lot about body image, uh, body dysmorphia, eating disorders, all those sorts of things. But one that if you can, I would um, really hope that you would pick up. Okay, and the next book I'm going to talk about, and I don't know how to do this without gushing. I haven't even written the review for it yet on my bookstagram. And that is Real Life by Brandon Taylor. Firstly, thank you to everyone who messaged me on Instagram when I um, was sharing me reading this live saying that they were going to pick it up or they wanted to boost it from their TBRs because of um, how much joy it was clearly bringing me. And that's exactly what, what it did. It was, it was just a joyous experience to read. I fell in love with Wallace as a character. I actually don't think I love campus novels in general. The ones I've read in recent years, I can think of The Idiot, most of Donna Tartt, um, I've no interest in reading Infinite Jest, Infinite Jest, but I don't think I love campus novels. I think this is an exception as opposed to the rule for me because this is really a character study into Wallace and his experience as a young gay black man living in a small American city or town that is not, he just happens to be pursuing academia. It's not really, the college campus doesn't really play that much into it except for the fact that it's an isolated written ostensibly it is just about someone drifting at a time in their 20s where they're not sure what to do overcoming their life experiences they've had so far in order to pursue their self-actualization but he is saying so much about american culture or just in general modern societal views on our expectations to always want to pursue the best to be part of real life and the the theme of real life runs through this so much when Wallace and his friends talk about the fact that they operate in a world that is separate from the rest of reality because they live on this campus because they study science because they can shape their entire identity around their pursuit of academics and therefore if they were asked to go out and get a real job or operate on a nine to five basis doing something that was more menial what would that mean for their identity because so much of that is tied to who they are because in the pursuit of something bigger i.e the pursuit of their academic work which i think gave me so many things to consider and although that it is about um it is about this one weekend and this one experience it really is tied to the geography of the place like i mentioned when i was reading it in my last update that it is so focused on this very narrow set of 
physical and also intellectual space for these characters because they only operate in the worlds of work and friendship and family and then they can never have all three at once one of those things is slipping for Wallace he experiences of familial loss and but therefore he can't process that because so much of his world is taken up with his work and he also always puts his friends second to his work and I think it's a really great exploration of I guess the brain power it takes to participate in real life and I think that that was really really clever of um, Taylor to incorporate the academic element because when I first started reading it I wasn't interested in the science part and I found it quite, actually quite jarring to read about but the more I saw the more I read on the more I understood why he chose to use that very specific type of academic exposure where he was they are investigating organisms and these tiny cells of life the minutiae to show that Wallace couldn't possibly comprehend anything larger and these huge emotions these huge messy not black and white situations because the whole of his life and his academic career has been focusing on these things that are very clear-cut and crystal whereas when he has to deal with things that are messy like emotions like grief he, he doesn't know how to comprehend those because of the previous um, like traumatic childhood he's had and I think that's what led him to be a scientist to start with and I just thought wow Brandon Taylor you blew my mind that's all I have to say <laughs> Okay, and then getting on to what I listened to, I also mentioned in my last video, I listened to Sissy by Jacob Tobiah, and that is a, a memoir of a trans person talking about their experience. It, it mainly, I would say, focuses on their adolescence and then their life in um, college. They went to Duke, and they talk a lot about Duke life and fraternity or paternity, those sort of um, very American college experiences, which I obviously don't have personal experience about, but you read a lot about in other books and popular culture references and but sometimes I find it quite grating because I feel like the university experience in the UK is very different and it seems like over there it's very all in it's your whole life it's your whole identity you can't possibly make friends outside of your universe I love the bit where they went to work um at the UN and they were talking about dressing and professionalism and expressing your gender identity while working in a job that has a conservative workforce behind it which also was really interesting aside to the demographic working at the UN which was interesting and they kept returning to the situations happening on campus although I can sympathize that that's a big experience in that person's life when it's happening I would have liked to have seen the trajectory go further and their decision to move from pursuing politics and policy work to um, ending up in a creative role and that experience while expressing um, a non-binary gender identity but overall I would recommend it I thought it was really interesting trans person's experience so that's always good to read about. I also listened to Me Talk Pretty One Day by David Sedaris. He is an American humorist writer, which I'm sure lots of you would have heard or known about before. I have a lukewarm relationship with Sedaris. I'm not extremely fussed by his sense of humor. I do find some of his, his personal anecdotes quite funny. This one talks a lot about his um, relationship with his father and then his move from the US to France with his partner and the intersections where he talks about living in Paris and living in rural France as an American and the cultural identity of being an American abroad I thought were really interesting and in places quite clever but um, again not memorable and I don't think I would pick up a lot of his work and that's the third I've listened to so far and I think I find it quite samey after a while I know some people are huge David Sedaris fans but I think I can park him uh, as a writer for now for me. So finished Afropean by Johnny Pitts, which I feel like I've spoken about before, but I wrote an uh, in-depth review on my bookstagram and I love this. I think everyone, absolutely everybody should read it. Johnny Pitts is a photographer from Sheffield and he um, is also a writer and he spends a month backpacking through Europe investigating what it means to be black and European and understand if there is a homogenous group of afropean people or if it is a lot of subsections of different cultures coming together under the title of afropean because that is the label that um a white majority society has put on them it blew my mind honestly it schooled me in so many misconceptions i had about progressive europe about um, the netherlands where i've spoken before my partner lives and we hope to live in the future and their take on racism and quite frankly their abhor uh, abhorrent lack of care towards making an anti-racism part of their society 
it looks at Scandinavia, specifically Stockholm and Copenhagen, and what it what it means to be part of the um, black elite over there or part of the um, arts movement compared to what it means if you're a member of the working class. He dissects the class and race intersection really well, and I just thought, I think he's fantastic, and I'm so envious my partner's going to look at his um, photography exhibition uh, next weekend in Amsterdam, and I'm so gutted that I won't be there to see it myself. Um, and then I listened to also an audio on Scribd before I was a critic, I was a human being by Amy Fung. And this again took me by surprise. It's a collection of essays written by a um, Chinese uh, immigrant who's moved to America as a child and her experiences in the arts, specifically in the visual arts and what it means to partake in um, an arts career when you are a member of a... Uh, a marginalized group and the idea of diversity as a tick box exercise in the third sector and to have a place at the table when the table really actually has no interest in what you're saying except to tell other white people that look at us we've got a diverse person sitting at our table um she really goes goes into detail about her experiences as an art critic writing for art publications but i wouldn't say it focuses heavily on um art as a um, creative form in the sense that you need to know about art to read the book because she also interjects with lots of experiences from um, First Nations Canadian residents talking about their experiences in the reform schools and the residential homes that were rife in the 1950s onwards and that um, intergenerational trauma that has been created. And obviously very recently in the past couple of weeks in Nova Scotia in Canada, there's been a lot of um, debate and um, quite serious incidences occurring with First Nations and um, Can and then other Canadian fishermen fighting over um, fishing permits on native land. I will link an article below to read about that and also a couple of native Canadian and American bookstagrammers you can follow who post a lot about um, First Nations experiences, which I think is super important because it's not well publicised over uh, in the UK and um, it's always important to learn about those experiences of people who are were living on land before it was taken by people who wanted to colonise it. Um, so yeah, I really, really loved that collection. I would love to get it in a uh, physical form because I thought that Fung had some really, really interesting takes specifically on diversity that would be relevant for any um, field of learning. I read Resisting the Attention Economy by Jenny O'Dell. I really wanted to love this book, but it didn't hit the mark for me. What Jenny O'Dell is talking about is the experience of being um, forced into this constant stream of work and play and making your um, side hustles, your full hustles and your uh, brains being taken up by being online all the time. But she then uses that discussion of the attention economy and how we must fight against it while talking about... Um, like reattaching ourselves to nature and um she got into like bird watching and understanding different flower and fauna and how we can use one as a force against the other and i really think and it was an interesting discussion but it wasn't what i went into the book looking for i wanted to learn more about the the move away from social media and the reason why the psychology of our brain that makes us so addicted to these platforms and what it can do for our um mental and physical well-being but she does cover that but then moves quite swiftly on to talking about it in the sense of the environment that surrounds us and these sort of like bio landscapes that we must immerse ourselves in in a very specific context i think in, it was california that she was talking specifically about so a lot of the geographical locations were um also lost on me so yeah i'm i really wanted to love it but it wasn't exactly what i'm looking for if anyone has read any books that talk about um the attention economy, the idea of workism, the constant switching on of our brains, what that's going to do to us in the future, please, um, I would love some recommendations down below because I would love to read more about that. And then I read, which I don't have a copy of because I lent it to someone in my book club because it's my real life book club pick, Boy Parts by Eliza Clark. I haven't posted my review for this yet because I haven't finished writing it because I'm not sure what to say. <laughs> Um, this book did the rounds on Bookstagram last month or like in over the summer basically and it is a coming of age psychological character study, um, a, sat a satirical take on um, 
female artistry and what it means to operate in a patriarchal society as a female artist and the main character is extremely unlikable which is fine I have no problem with unlikable characters but the thing that jarred me so much about this was only until about three quarters of the way through you are convinced that they Irina is a normal not normal but like a, a functioning person with with the desire to participate in society as a normal person but and, and views her art as a way to subvert that but then an incident happens like three quarters of the way through where you're like okay obviously she must be psychopathic or sociopathic because she this is a spoiler but she ends up like killing someone and you sort of think like okay now this is turning into a bit of a horror book and I just didn't really I didn't really vibe with that I wanted it to be one or the other and I don't care that Irina was unlikable I love to read unlikable characters but what I think was really interesting was I read it straight after I read um, exit Man. Lauren the main character the main female character in this book is extremely unlikable but but what Booth does is she sets up the backstory to understand the position that has brought her to the person that she is now why she's so guarded why she feels the need to be so abrasive towards people and obviously she's less of an extreme caricature than um Irina in boy parts but for boy parts it just didn't there was no nothing to grab onto to understand why Irina decided to be this person that she is until you realise that she's a sociopath. Do you see what I mean? There was no, I guess, substance to her choices. So I found it hard to find them believable until I understood that you weren't meant to find them believable. But then I just found that like really jarring because I was like, well, why bother setting her up as a normal person? Hi, guys, it's editing me here. I've lost the end footage to my September wrap up but I don't have the energy to refilm it and I'm really sorry but I just wanted to say that for me boy parts there wasn't the emotional payoff for the um how harrowing some of the storylines were and how graphic they were I think it fell into the same story category as A Little Life or My Dark Vanessa but for those I felt like the use of extreme violent sexual explicity and um emotional manipulation felt w like a literary device that was worth it for me and I think with boy parts I just felt like it was violence for violence sake and um sort of like who could be the most obscure and yeah just didn't quite work for me which was disappointing but anyway all of that to say um that's what I read in September I hope you liked um, my video um, please leave a comment about the best book you read in September and any of these that you hope to read soon and I'll be back next week with my October plans